Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God is a good God. And he's still in control. Amen. I'd like to say good afternoon or good evening to all of those I hadn't had the opportunity to speak to. Amen. God is so good to all of us. To allow us to be among the living once again. Amen. Because some, some are alive and don't even know that they are alive. So thank God for his grace and his mercy. Amen. We want to continue on with our study. We, we finished up chapter four last week. And we're going to start on chapter five. I'll tell you, we're getting down to the goody of it now. We're getting down into the goody. To recap what we went over in chapter four. After Jesus had finished talking to John and given him the words to say to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, Jesus says, I got to bring you up a little higher. I got I got to show you some more stuff that is to come. The Bible says that John looked up and he saw an opened door, a door already open and he starts seeing some things. But the first thing that caught his eye was a big throne, a glorified throne. And the glory of God was sitting on that throne. He even said the one who sat on the throne. And around the throne, he saw 20 and four elders. And they sat on 20 and four seats or 24 thrones. And in the midst of the throne, he said that he saw four beasts. And he described all those four beasts and the things in which he described. And we told you last week that beast is an inaccurate description of them. These were living creatures that he saw. And in these living creatures, there were the characteristics of God. And we tried to explain what each of these characteristics stood for. And so tonight we're going to go a little further. Now, let me explain how, how God is doing this with John. There is no way that John could catch all of this, the things that God had for him in one at one time. So God has got to show John things in stages because as John is looking, all of this is going on. But John could only describe things one at a time that he saw. It, it, it's just like us just looking at all the stuff going on around us and we can't say what all is going on, but we have to take it in sections over there. They're doing that over there. They're doing that. But John is looking in the throne and all of this is going on right around the throne of God. Are, are y'all with me? Amen. So let's get into chapter five. Let's get into chapter five. I, I was I was trying to think, should I try to go ahead and and do all 14 verses of chapter five. But then, then when I started studying, I said, hey, no way. Yeah, I mean, if we had three or four hours, yes. But not, not within 45 minutes, hey, amen. <laughs> amen, you're going to information overload. So no, we, we, won't, we won't do that. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to go as far as the spirit allow us to go tonight, but I know that we will not finish of chapter five and 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 if we'll pray the Lord that we'll have some more time to finish it. Amen. Amen. Verse one of chapter five. John is going a little further and he's seeing and describing something else. John said, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. John is continuing to explain the vision that he saw through the open door of heaven. And after seeing all that he had in chapter four, then he gives us some more details of the things that he see. First of all, John said he looked and he saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. He saw a book. This book that he saw was a scroll. 
They did not have books like we have today with they, they were bound in hard covers and stuff, but it was a scroll. And it was rolled up in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Are y'all with me? He saw the hand of God holding the scroll in, in, in his right hand. Amen. And he noticed on the scroll that there was writing on the inside and on the outside. Now, normally, see, that might not mean too much to you, but normally when 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 you have writing on a scroll, you only write on one side. But in this case, the scroll was written on the inside and the uh, are y'all okay y'all with me a, a, amen amen because of the amount of information contained in that book or in that scroll it had to be written on the inside and continued on the outside y'all understand because you got to understand who is the author of the scroll <laughs> And God had so much in that scroll that the inside could not contain all that God said or God needed to say. So it had to go on the outside as well. Look at our Bible. When you read John 21, the Bible tells us that the things that Jesus did, this book can't contain. Oh, really? Amen. God will do above and beyond anything that we can think and imagine are y'all are y'all with me so God is the author of this and John noticed that the things are written there's something written on the inside and the outside but the thing about the stuff that contents that's written on the inside and the outside John could not read it because it was rolled up and sealed <laughs> he, 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 he know that there was something on the inside and outside, but it was rolled up and it was sealed. Amen. He said it had seven seals. It has seven seals. A -a Amen. And we know that the word seven mean what? Complete. It was complete. Whatever was in the book, it was completed because as the, as the Bible says in the book of Hebrew, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. So whatever God had written in that book or in that scroll, he had finished it. Amen. It was finished. The seven seals showed that it was complete. And whatever the scroll contained, it had been authored and completed by God. And to be sealed meant it was concealed from the world and to be revealed by parts as to bringing to pass those things decreed in it. Which means that when God finished it and sealed it, there was nothing else to be written. <laughs> when, when he sealed it, we could say that and the book was closed. Because God had finished the writing, he sealed it with seven seals. Are, are, are y'all with me? A amen. This content had to be revealed by parts because John could not comprehend it in its totality. Whatever God had, it was too massive for John to receive all at one time. Amen. There was an old joke. There's an old joke to say, you know, if you got an elephant, how do you eat an elephant? And we know that an elephant is a big animal, but you can eat an elephant. But how can you eat it? One part at a time. Amen. So he had to receive this one part at a time. Amen. Let's jump into that second verse. So now he saw a book in his right hand. Remember that he saw a book in God's right hand. The one that sat on the throne, it was in his right hand. Remember that. It was in his right hand. Okay, remember that. All right, look at verse two. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. John said that he saw a strong angel and he was proclaiming with a loud voice. See, the identity of this angel is not given. It is not told who this strong angel is. A amen. But 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 I, I kind of feel that it's Gabriel. 
And there's, there's, there's a reason I feel this way. A -a Amen. Because Gabriel, the name Gabriel means strength of God. So if it is a strong angel, the strength of God would be Gabriel. And watch this. Remember, I mentioned Daniel and Ezekiel also had visions of heaven being open. Now, look at what Daniel said in Daniel's vision in Daniel 8 and 16. It said, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uliel, Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Daniel's vision saw a man's voice calling to Gabriel to talk to Daniel and tell him how, what this vision is about. So if John heard the voice or saw this strong angel, I'm saying, even though the Bible didn't say, I'm imagining that it's Gabriel. It was a strong angel. Now, it said a strong angel cried out with a loud voice as if it was calling out to see who is worthy in heaven and on earth to come forth to open this book. Who could come and reveal what is hidden in the scroll and to execute what is written? Now, this strong angel called out. Apparently, they waited for a minute to see if anybody answered. <laughs> they waited to see if anybody could answer. Who is worthy? Who is worthy? to open this book and to loose the seals. Now, did anybody answer? No, nobody answered. Let's look, at, let's look at verse three. Nobody answered. And when nobody answered, verse three says, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Nobody in heaven nor in earth or under the earth. That phrase right there, in earth, under the earth, in heaven, talks about the entire universe, which would represent the entire creation of God. When God said, let there be, there was never anything created that is worthy to open this book and to read what the content. Now, notice what, the, notice what John said now. Not just get the book, open it and read it, but not even to look at it. That, that's, that's not me. That's what it said. Neither to look thereon. They were not even worthy to look thereon. A amen. No one, mankind nor angel. Ooh. Nobody. Nobody, Ralph. Nobody. That, that's what the word says. Nobody was worthy to open or remove the seals from the scroll and read it. See, because you got to understand, since, since John said here, and I saw no man, you got to understand there are some things that man can't do. Some things are left for only God to. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how scientific you are. I don't care what kind of theories you come up. There are some things that man can't do. But is there anything? <laughs> Y'all my people, boy. Is there anything too hard for God? Amen. Regardless of your, this man's calling, regardless of your title, regardless of your position, man does not possess the power to open that book. And John saw this. Nobody jumped up and say, I'm apostle this, or I'm bishop this, or I'm pastor this, or I'm missionary, a prophet is this. I don't care what your title and position is, you still aren't worthy to open that book. A a amen, somebody. A amen. And some of us on earth, we better be careful because a lot of us feel that we got one foot in heaven and one foot on earth and, and they're doing you a favor by being here. But baby, I don't care who you think you are. I don't care if you never stink because you don't wash. You still aren't worthy to open that book. Amen. 
And when nobody volunteered and when nobody said, I know I'm worthy, I'm, I'm so and so, so and so. And I went to this seminary and I got all these degrees and I feel that I ain't did what the old rock gut centers did over there. Nobody stood up and said they were worthy. Mm -hmm. So when John saw that nobody was worthy, nobody volunteered, nobody stepped up. Look what John said in verse four. And I wept much. <laughs> John said, I started crying because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Nobody was that proud to stand up and say, I'm worthy to do this. Because I, I, I can imagine in my mind, I can imagine in my mind, Satan won't even have the guts to stand up to God anymore. After that whipping he took and got kicked out of heaven that first time, he learned that he don't have the power and he's not worthy to be in certain positions as God is. A -a Amen. John began to cry because it seemed that there was no one to open this book. In fact, these unworthy men were even kept from looking at the book. Throughout all of God's creation, there is not one man or celestial being who was, who is, or ever will be worthy to open this book and even look at the scroll that God has in his right hand. This book that God has in his right hand, nobody was worthy to receive the contents of that book, open it, and read it. Remember, God is the author of it. God wrote everything in that book and he sealed it up. It is the complete work of God. Because you got to remember, man is in time. So whatever's in that book, time can't contain it. It has to be eternal. Are, are y'all with me? A amen. John was sad because nobody... The Pope, no, Pope ain't worried. Uh, apostle this, no, they ain't worried. Uh-uh, they not worthy. Ezekiel, no, he ain't worried. Moses, no, he ain't worthy. David, heck to the no, he ain't worthy. No, no, none of, none of them, none of them. So John is now sad. He's crying. But look at that fifth verse. I'm, I'm so glad that God, God knows our heart. He sees what's in our heart and, and God ha knows a way to comfort us. Look at verse five. It says, and one of the elders, one of the 20 and four elders, one of the 24 elders said unto him, said unto me, weep not. Don't cry. <laughs> Behold or look the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. There is one. There is one who is worthy. One of the elders came to John and comforted him and tell him that there is somebody who is worthy. And he gave John a few names of what he is called who was worthy. A amen. The names of our Lord are never given by accident, but all of them convey a part of his nature. Whatever God is called, it reveals a part of his nature. And we know that we we've studied the names that God is called. We, we studied Jehovah and and Yahweh and Elohim and El Kana and El Hana and, and, and Jehovah Nissi and Jehovah Shalom and Jehovah Rapha and Jehovah Rohi. We discussed with all we we talked about all of those names and it talks about the nature of God. Amen. And this elder now tell John that there is one who is worthy. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he's the root of David and he hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. First of all, he said that it is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now this is the description that Moses gave to, to, to Judah 
in Genesis 49 and 8. And he wrote of he wrote of this. He wrote of this when he wrote Genesis 49, 8 and 9. He said, Judah, thou art he whom thou brethren shall praise. Thy name shall be in the neck of thine enemy. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. Whelp, W-H-E-L-P. Whelp means a, a child, a kitten, the son of the king. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down or humbled himself. He couched as a lion and as a as an old lion who shall rouse him up. This speaks of his fierceness and his strength, which although glimpsed in his glimpsed in his first coming, which means that we didn't see a lion in his first coming, but we saw a lamb. Yeah. Ooh, boy, boy. <laughs> Jesus did not appear in the fullness of his power until the moment anticipated what John sees here. Are, are y'all with me? When he came the first time, he did not come as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he came as a lamb. We're going to get into that a little further. A amen. So he was described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Are, are y'all with me? A amen. Then he was described as the root of of David, the root of David. This is another messianic title found in Isaiah 11 and 10. And in the in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign or an example of our people or a sign of the people to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. See, this meant that he will be a descendant of David. The root of David means that he'll be a descendant of David. Are, are y'all with me? Who with devastating force will compel the wicked of the earth to succumb to his authority. Now, what does that mean? That means that every knee <laughs> shall bow. Every eye shall see him. Every tongue shall confess that he is king of kings and Lord <laughs> of Lord. A amen. And this, of course, refers to Jesus's incarnation on his birth with his roots being in the family of David as the root of David. This is showing that he is a descendant of David. Now watch this. He is a descendant of David, yet an ancestor. <laughs> he, he is a descendant of David, but yet an ancestor. He is a son of David, yet the father of David. Okay, okay, y'all get, a amen. Even now, now notice it said that he is the root of David. Now, this is not just saying that he is a descendant because we can't have a tree without having the root. So if you are a root, that means that you are an ancestor because the tree have to come from the root. Branches come from the truth. So branches of the, a, amen, are y'all fine? Branches represent the descendants. So Jesus is both the root and the branch. Uh, yeah, are y'all, are y'all, y'all with me? Remember the covenant that God made with David. He told David that I am going to set your seed on the throne and it will last forever. De Jesus Christ is that root or that promised covenant seed of David that will sit on the throne forever. Amen. So he said the root of David, the root of David, he hath prevailed. And it's saying now he had prevailed to open the book and to unloose the seal. He had prevailed. Now that indicates that if he's prevailed, that means he's been in a battle. That means that he's won. He's got the victory. So, so, so what battle? What battle did Jesus fight? He fought. He fought the battle over. He won the battle over sin and over Satan. He won it over sin and over Satan. Amen. And he won it in a way that nobody would expect him. Now watch this. Most of the time when somebody win a battle, they're standing as a, victor as a victorious over the enemy. But Jesus won by dying. <laughs> 
G- Jesus won by dying. Y'all, y'all miss that. Because when you die, you don't win. That means you lost. But Jesus won by dying. Well, what you talking about? He won by dying because when Jesus died, when Jesus died, death got him and thought that he had him. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, you, the, you, the king of the Jews, you, the son of God, yeah. But I got you now because they put him in a grave. Death thought that he had it. Satan was celebrating because he thought that he had won. But early on Sunday morning, <laughs> early on Sunday morning, God came down and, and shook him a little bit and said, son, it's time to get up. And when he got up, he had all power. Amen. Amen. This Bible study. This Bible study. This Bible study. Amen. This Bible study. <laughs> A- amen. Amen. So he prevailed. And because of that victory, because of that victory, that made him worthy to open the book and to unloose the seals. Are, are, y'all, are y'all with me? A- A- amen. Paul, Paul described in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of the law, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ain't God all right? Amen. Jesus is the only one who is worthy to open that book. (laughs) He is worthy. Touch your neighbor and tell him he's worthy. Amen. Amen. Let's look look at verse 6. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6, John says, And I beheld, I saw, I looked, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb now watch this stood a lamb as it had been slain wait a minute now okay we're gonna get in there we gotta, gotta, gotta okay having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent forth into all the earth First of all, John is looking, he's looking at the same scene that he had, he had, he had seen when he first went up and the door was open, but he's now seeing more detail. Uh, Are y'all with me? And and he's astonished what he saw because he said, I looked and, and lo, see, we'll say, we would say, whoa, whoa. Because the vision was so amazing that he saw, he said, lo, in the midst of the throne, he said he saw something. He said, he said, now notice this, watch what he said. He said, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts which were in the midst of the throne as well. He said, and in the midst of the elders, in the midst of all of that, he said that he, it, it stood a lamb. Wait a minute. He said it stood a lamb. But the elder told him that it was the lion. John did not see the lion. John saw the lamb. Is this a contradiction of what the elder told him? No, it's not. Watch this. Watch this. He said that he saw he saw a lamb. John saw him. He was a sacrificial lamb. The elder saw him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, God, you got to understand, God required the Jews to bring the Passover lamb into their houses for four days. This is when the Passover was established. You got to bring a a Passover lamb, the lamb that you were going to kill for the Passover. You got to bring it into the house for four days and it almost becomes a pet. It almost becomes a pet. And then it's violently killed. Because it's split and the blood is drained out of it. Are, are, y- are y'all with me? A- a- amen. Jesus is the true Passover lamb 
God's only begotten son. See, John the Baptist said, John the Baptist said in John 1 and 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you got to understand, Jesus sacrificed himself for you and for me. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the central figure of all of this. John was realizing the death of the lamb as well as him resurrected. How can I say this? I want you to watch this. Notice the wording that John used. John said, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. If it had been slain, that means it, had to, it was dead. It looked like it was dead, but yet it was standing. <laughs> it looked like it had been slain, but yet it was alive, which means that who John saw bear the marks of the stuff and the torment that it had been through in order to, to have that sacrifice made. He saw the marks in his head. He saw the marks in his side. He saw the piercing of his head. He saw the marks in his feet. It looked like he had been slain, but yet he was alive. <laughs> yes, yet he was alive. A amen. Amen. This is what he saw. The evidence of his wounds from its slaughter were still clearly visible, but yet he was alive and standing. Remember what Isaiah said. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes or with his stripes. We are healed. Amen. This is what we saw. Remember in the earlier verses of, of, of chapter 53, it said that we couldn't, we wouldn't, he wasn't, he wasn't even good to look upon. We couldn't even recognize him as a human being. But yet he still stood. <laughs> now John saw him. <laughs> John saw him. And this is, this is such a beautiful picture that we see here. Because even though the elder refers to our Lord in his glory as a lion, indicating his power and his might, John sees him as a sacrificial lamb. The elder sees him as a lion, but John sees him as a lamb because you got to understand when John looked at him, he was looking at him through the eyes of faith. <laughs> John was seeing who he was to him. He couldn't see the lion yet because John hadn't seen the lion. John has only seen the lamb. <laughs> Remember, John wrote about him. He, this is the one he saw in the beginning. When he wrote about in the beginning was, was God. And, and in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And he went on down and said, it wasn't nothing made without the word of God. He saw this lamb. This is what John saw. A amen. Those who reject Christ, those who reject Christ will see him as a lion when he comes to judge the world and to reign over them. But those who have accepted him and know what he's done for you, you won't see him as a lion, but you're going to see him as the lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. Amen. And this lamb that he saw, he said that he had seven horns. Now, a horn represents power or indicates power in the Bible. But this lamb that he saw had seven horns. So if he had seven, one horn represents power, but seven horns represent all power. Thank you, brother. Seven horns represent all power. So who he saw, the Lamb of God had all power. Are y'all with me? He had, he had all power. He did not manifest all of his power when he was here as the Lamb. But when he comes the next time as the Lion, he's going to come in all of his glory. A amen. The glorious appearing. It will be in the manifestation of his, his omnipotence or his all powerfulness. In all of his consuming power, 
This is what the seven horns represent, but not only the seven horns, but he also has seven eyes. Hey, oh, girl, you better talk to me. He has seven eyes, and, and that means that he possessed all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He was all seeing. He was omniscient. Amen. He was omniscient. Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world or all the earth. These eyes speak of the judgment of our, of our Lord, including the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit that rest on him without measure. John 3 and 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him, which meant that Jesus, when he came, when the Holy Spirit came and sat upon him in the form of a dove, that means that Jesus had the fullness of God on him. Jesus was the fullness of God walking among men. Jesus was not 50% man and 50% God. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. So all of God was here inside of a body. <laughs> Jesus had just as much power down here as he had up there. Because Jesus did some things that man could not do. Jesus could raise the dead. He could heal the sick. But he didn't, have, he didn't just work with, with humans and stuff. Jesus worked with nature as well. He stepped out in that storm and said, peace. <laughs> he was given the spirit without measure and the only one that has the spirit without measure is the spirit himself who is God Ooh, the seven spirits the seven spirits of God and we've gone over this in earlier chapters the seven spirits of God found in Isaiah the 11th chapter in that second verse and it was saying you have the spirit of the Lord the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven characteristics of the spirit that are engulfed or encompassed in the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Let's go ahead with this last verse. Let's go ahead and knock out this last verse. I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that one. I'll stop with this one. Amen. The seventh verse says, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. OK, we're talking about the lamb. He came and took the book out of the hand of the right hand, out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Let me read that to you again. He came and took the book out of the hand of him that sat on the, on the throne, a amen, took it out of his right hand. Are, are y'all with me? Now, this is what John sees now. John sees this going on. John sees Jesus in the midst of the glory of the throne of God as the lamb as it had been slain. This is, this is very unusual what John here who sees because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the strength of God at the right hand of the Father. Are y'all with me? Yes. Now, he's at the right hand of the Father. The scroll is in the right hand of the Father. <laughs> so what John saw, John actually saw Jesus holding the scroll. <sighs> he, he saw Jesus holding the scroll. Are y'all with me? But yet... He saw Jesus holding the scroll, but yet he saw him take the scroll. This is what he sees. That, that's what John said. I'm reading what John said. Amen. First of all, it said that the lamb came and took the scroll. Wait a minute. Only God can approach God. All right. All right. <laughs> Don't you move, Cameron. <laughs> 
Only God can approach God. Because of the height of God's throne in heaven, nobody could reach God but God. So the only one who could possess the book had to be <laughs> and if Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, that meant that he had the book. So he received the book as the lamb, but he already had the book as the lion. <laughs> Which means that he already had the But to show John, the only one who could get the book was God himself. He had to come in the form of the lamb. Whoo, boy. You got to remember in Matthew 28 and 18, Jesus said when he had been resurrected, he said, all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. So re to receive the book means that he had that power. Uh, are y'all with me? And hey, go ahead and close this out. <laughs> Remember the question that was asked by the strong angel. Who is worthy to open the book and who is worthy to unleash the, unloose the seals? You remember that? Now, that question, as I'm, as I'm imagining in my mind, that question was rhetorical, which means that it didn't have an answer. It wasn't looking for a response. When the angel asked, who is worthy? So that God had to tell the angel, make that announcement. <laughs> Remember, angels are messengers. And they only speak what God tells. Okay, y'all with me? So when he asked that question, God had to tell him, ask that question to see who's going to answer. Knowing and God knowing that nobody wasn't going to answer because nobody was worthy except God himself. God was demonstrating that only the creator was worthy to open it. Only the Alpha and the Omega was worthy to open it. Only the beginning and the end was able to open. Only the first and the last was worthy to open. Only the Ancient of Days was worthy. Only the blessed and only potentate of the universe was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. A amen. God knew that nobody would step up <laughs> except himself because he is the author <laughs> and the finisher of our faith. So if God wrote the book, only God was worthy to read what was in the book. If God wrote the book, only God could open the book. If God wrote the book and sealed it and said it was finished, the only one who could loose it would be God himself. Because God opened doors that no man could shut and God shut doors. And if God closed the book, that book is closed. And the only way it's going to get open, if God opens it himself. himself. Any questions or comments on one through seven? <laughs> Any questions on that?